Are you okay, Kevin? Hang on, he's tired. Tired? We got a lot of work to do, Kevin. We have to do tons of hours. Well, we are trying to, Dave. You drive you, not do it. The institute is scared of me right now. He's scared of me. Okay, next picture. That joke is in the kitchen. That's in the kitchen? No, it is. Okay, from this. This is the Humphrey Yep. Yeah. Now that's the kitchen. Is it? Yeah. Is that what it looked like, David? Mm hmm. Yeah? Did okay. you ever work in the kitchen? Yep. I worked on the dishwasher. The dishwasher? How mm -hmm. often did you work? Every day. Did they pay you? No, no. Oh, no, that's the, that's the main building. The main building? No, that is the boy building. Is that where you used to live, David? No. Yeah? Does that bring back memories, David? No. I'm glad how they put the one bathroom. See? Obviously, no privacy whatsoever. No. Really bare. Yeah. Did you see those bathrooms, David? I've been in them. Yeah? Are they bare like this picture, David? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's pretty sad. Yeah. That's no more now. No more? It's got walls now. Walls dividing? No. Look at this. Look at this picture here. You tell me on that picture that we're made that people have privacy. This one here. These rooms have nothing. No curtains, no privacy. Nothing. Well, with David, he's been abused at that institution for so many years that he didn't know what, we, what was going on in there. So he ran away about nine times. <clears throat> on the ninth time, they just said, let him go. And he lives in the community, and he may be a pain in the neck sometimes, but <laughs> I've, I've known him longer than anybody. And I agree with people. Institutions should be shut down, Amen. not kept open. The men of public government would just wake up and smell the coffee. And we should close down these institutions. Thank you. I'm sure there were some kids in there that nobody ever visited. People put them there and just forgot about them. He told me not to see nothing but went on him. He told me not to see nothing but went on him. How would you let a take it? When they go home, you don't tell them nothing but went on him. Nothing. I'm not phone there. Yeah. I'm asking what went on I don't remember that. We did phone a few times because of what you told Mom, and she was the When mom. I went back to I got locked up for it. Mm -hmm. three weeks. Yeah, so then we wouldn't phone anymore because then we was getting him in trouble, you know. It still was a secret, man. A lot of that stuff has changed, no, David. No, no. He still got secret in there, David. No? He still got it. He thought there was no way. That's why we have to go, you know. Sad it down, lock it up. Yeah, I mean, they, they should um, think about people first. Let's get the message out. Let's free our people. This is called, We Gotta Close the Institutions. A group that wants to see people with disabilities taken out of institutions is taking their message on the road. We leave tomorrow morning, which is Saturday, so we're 
just packing today and uh, very busy. Here we are packing. It's the first ever People First Freedom Tour. People First members are traveling across the prairies in an RV to raise awareness about those who are still living in institutions. I'll be waiting for tomorrow and Chris is coming with us. She's the driver. That's me. <laughs> the focus of the tour is to see people for who they are, not for the labels that are attached to them. The institutions are not places for people. The community is a place for people. Because of somebody who lived in the institution for 21 years of, of, of his life, um, I felt that it was important to come out and say, look, people belong in the community. People belong in the community with support. You know, it's something that should have happened a long time ago to make people aware well, of what's going on or what you're trying to argue. Do. So well, he asked, I hope know. they have a wonderful trip. And may good, the good Lord go with them okay. and look after them all. My name is Mark Blanchard. I got involved with the whole Freedom Tour because I heard that the government was putting in $40 million to keep MDC open. I said, I can't let that happen. If we can get the word out that institutions should be shut down. We saw a documentary of a bunch of people in the States. They went all over the States in an RV and we said to ourselves, hey, this would be great. So after months and months and months of planning, uh, it finally came together. Okay, hello, welcome to the tour. My name is Jeff Remy, and I've been on the ADC for 18 years, and I'm tired of watching how people hate bad. I hope we can kill them down. That's what we're here for. That's why I came on this tour. You sat them down. I'm the man. I hope it works out. Okay, you're next. Whoa. Your name? Uh, my name is Valerie Wolbert, and I'm the president of People First of Winnipeg. Can you tell me uh, what's going on today? Today, we're going to have a walk and roll for freedom. We're trying to educate the public that all people with intellectual disabilities can be out of the institutions and into the communities. Um, we, everybody are having yellow and black balloons. The black represents people that have died in the institution, and the yellow one that give people hope. The silhouettes represent the people that are still left in the institution, and we want them out. Okay, hey, everybody, let's free our people. Free our people. Instead of free our people, free our balloons. Hey. Would everybody please follow me to the corner? Thank you. Free our people! When do we want it? Now! What do we want the minister to do? Free our people! When do we want it? Now! Who should live in institutions? No one! I'll, I'll start. Uh, my name is Nicola, and this is my daughter Catherine. And when she was um, diagnosed as having severe and widespread brain damage, I was told, put her into an institution. You know, forget you ever had her. Go home and have more children. So I went home and had more children, but there's no way Catherine would ever have landed up in an institution. I wanted to ask you, as, as a parent, why you did not put Catherine into a, the institution? And well, Catherine was born 45 years ago. She deserved to, to live with us and she was always, always been part of our family. We've been very lucky because we've had incredible support from so many people, our family, um, lots of family here today, and lots of people living in the community who have helped us and have enriched Catherine's life. Today is a celebration because she has lived in this house for 20 years. Catherine doesn't speak, so I don't like really speaking for her, but I know she would hate to live in an institution. Right. Yeah. So thanks, Kevin. Free yeah. our people. We just got to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until the government just gives up and just say we'd submit. Well, here we are at the end of our freedom tour walk. Free our people. Awesome.
Awesome. Dave wasn't able to interview his friend, Freddie, at MDC. But he did interview somebody who got out of the institution. Wayne lived at MDC for 30 years, and the staff at MDC accused, accused Wayne of a sexual assault, which he never committed. And Wayne was in lockup for seven years, locked up for something that he never did. Hello, Wayne. Hello, Dave. <laughs> you remember me? Yeah, I remember you at the ham DC. Good. Mother sit down, relax for a while. Yep. No, no, let's sit down. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah. How you doing? All right there, Dave. Good, good, yeah. good. Still in Winnipeg? Uh, yep, yep. Good for you, my friend. Glad we had them. Yeah. Get away from that place, sir. Yeah? <laughs> I don't blame you. It did bad things to you. What did it do to you, Wayne? Yeah. Used to do some awful things there, but... Yeah? Yeah. Didn't like it, but... How long did you live there, Wayne? Over 30 years. It's time to move out. <laughs> took a long time? Yeah. Took a long time, yeah. <laughs> but we got out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It's easy to get in there. Yeah, it is. But it's hard to get out. Yeah. Some awful things, uh, I wouldn't want to speak about them. Uh, Davey, remember what the staff used to do in the ward? Mom used to go around and take uh, guys in the room and beat them up and stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that all right. Did they pick you up? Yeah, they used to do that, but I... Mm-hmm. Hey, Dave, do you remember over by North Grove where somebody uh, hanged himself up? Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. You remember how they used to go up in the water tower and jump off? Go so camping. He jumped up the water tower. Yeah. It went the time. And there was another person who went off there. I won't forget what happened. Never. No. Remember for the rest of your life, hmm? my friend. Keep it on for the rest of your life. Yep, my friend. Things that used to happen there, but makes you kind of wonder. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Remember in the bedroom there? Yeah. Huh? Used to be pissing shit all over the place, and we had to clean it all up. Yep. The bathroom, you know, the bathroom. Yeah, couldn't hardly use that, but people yeah. used to go and drink all the toilet bowls and all they used to run around all bare naked. Naked, but not none. Yeah, it's just... That way. Yeah, I remember that all right. Boy in the bathroom, fucking all night. Yeah. No? Yeah, lots of that was going on, too. No, a lot of it was going on. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Was shit before that night then? Yeah. Been dirty? Yeah. Huh? There should be some awful things there, Dave. Dirty yeah. one boy in one room? Yeah. You should be in the big dumb, Jerry. Yeah, I did, yes. Huh? Yeah. I remember seeing that. Yeah. Huh? yeah. No one could back to live there. No, no I no. don't. Sorry. No. I've had enough. We can't do that at all. We're not going to give up. No. We're going to keep on pushing. <laughs> What's it take a lot of it? I used to have a John Deere bike, but it's one complaint. <laughs> yeah. Got a brand new one. I've seen people at MDC. They're not different from, from David Wayne and all those people that we've interviewed. They're about like, like the average person. 
My name is Trisha Kellen, and I'm here today to share a little bit about what happened a year ago, a year ago in 2006, to my daughter at MDC in Port of Chapuri. My daughter is 31, and she's physically, mentally challenged. From a, she has a head injury from a car accident 20 years ago. We had come to a point of uh, depression that Tammy was in, that it was decided MDC would be a place for her to go to be cleaned out of meds and to take her off the medications that she was on. When we were, my husband and I were first told about MDC, all we knew about it was it was an institution. Always said to each other that we would never ever consider putting our kids in there. When it came down to no other place in Winnipeg for my daughter to go to be taken off of the medications, we really had to seriously think about it and they were telling us 21 days that she'd be there. It didn't seem like too bad. Self-abuse started, which is something we've never seen in our daughter. We watched her be bodily picked up and carried up staircases and restrained by three different people, one on each side, one laying on top of her. Uh, we were degraded by the nurses. It was supposed to be three weeks. After 52 days, we walked in and my daughter was standing there with no voice left from screaming. After screaming, 18 bruises from head to toe, two black eyes, huge lump on her forehead and a lump on the back of her head, and we just took her out. Hello, my name is Adrian Denny. I used to live at the Manitoba Development Center. The rules were very strict and I did not think they were very fair. When we did not follow these rules, we had our privileges taken away. Some of the staff were meaner than others, and these staff members would actually hit the patients. I witnessed a friend of mine being hit in the head and face for nothing more than simply getting upset about something. Finally, I would just like to add free our people. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. We're going to take some pictures of the place they call MDC. I call it a dump, but they call it MDC. That's where we're headed. We're going to see where David used to live. First, they lock him in. He gets out. Now he can't go back in without supervision. In my point of view, it's the hellhole from Manitoba. The government is putting in $40 million to renovate the whole place. They should give that $40 million to renovate homes. People can live in the community, not in the institutions. What was this building before? David, you used to live here, eh? Yeah, I lived here. In this very building? Yep. This is one of the ones they're tearing down to build the new... Uh, they're still putting new buildings up, and this is one of the ones they're planning on tearing down. I'm gonna go look around. Do you wanna come with no, me? No. You'll stay there? Okay. I met a man the other day. This is what he had to say He told me how things would have to change And how we needed to find a better way Go with him He talked of things I've never seen Down some to take it down How we'd been to places I've never been mentioned how the years had passed him by And then he said Free the people, free their minds It's quite simple, just be kind They have no rights, just let them go All our friends we've come to know We're gonna drive around and we're gonna look at the cemetery. We're gonna to try to find the cemetery. Um, 
we want to take some pictures out there and remember all these people that have already passed away from MDC. We want to remem remember them. Yeah. Okay, Susie? Yeah. <laughs> There's a song she wants to sing. Okay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound the sing. Orange like me. I like to help the, the freedom, freeing people. Why is found? Why is blind? But now I see. Certain people that are buried here, their kinfolk never did find out about them. They never were told. When they died, they didn't tell the the kinfolk, whoever they were, that they were dead. It's hard to believe there's so many unmarked graves here. Yeah. They're all in their 30s and 40s. It's very sad. And 20s, I think. Yeah, yeah. 22. Oh, so young. It started off as, as the five of us. Me, David, Kevin, Valerie, Susie. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hi. I was going to put you in a can. I guess we ready to go then. Shut up. Shut When we left Manitoba, then people first from different provinces joined us. James got into the act. Shane, John, Tracy, and Richard, like one big happy family. We were hoping to interview people who are who are living in in, in who are in the institutions. We couldn't get permission from the institutions. So we changed our strategy and we found survivors who basically got out. Yeah, we're on holidays for sure. Lucky us. I mean, we talk about integration in the community. Uh, one would hope that integration is going to become a part of the past and It'll just be supporting people to live their lives as any other person lives their lives. <laughs> oh, isn't this gorgeous? Oh, it's very pretty, eh, David? It's nice, eh? A lot of people who lived in institutions and got out, to this day, they were even afraid to, uh, say anything because they because they thought that if they ever said anything that it would get back to the institution and and they would be put back inside my name is Keith Ford I'm with the people's first a Regina chapter and I actually was in an institution at the time it was called was school for retardants I was about Four, four, four or five years old when I start when I went there, and it was a rough place. I didn't, I didn't like it. I know there was a lot of other people who were abused there besides myself. I know it was hard, and I felt sorry for them, and I know a lot of them died, died in there. You know. Hi, my name is Shelly Gofrich. I was in the institution in Valley View when I was very young. I'm painful experience, but I don't want to go into it. 
I'm trying to block it out. Does disabled people have a right to uh, free speech, free walking, doing doing whatever? Um, instead of being bossed around, and no one should should abuse abuse them. They don't treat people right. They never have and never will. I wish there was a way that we could put all the government in an institution, leave them there and see how they would like it. And they would probably say, oh my God, these people really live like this. My name is Richard Lesson. I was born in Windsor, Ontario. My job is to help any way Kevin and the rest of the crew need help. Um, my job is to make sure people are feeling good about themselves. Um, Sarah, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good to see you again. It's been a while, a couple of years. Yeah. Maybe you can share your story a little bit about your life. Uh, uh, where I was and how I got here. Yeah. Um, um, I was in uh, Mitchner Center in Red Deer for 20 years. At the age of 15, that's when I left my family completely. Um, I went to Mission Center when I was 15 years old, but I'll never forget. There was this great big brick building, and that's when I said goodbye to my family for a whole year. We could not see family for a whole year. I was really scared, but I did what they wanted, and I worked really hard and other people worked hard too. We worked harder than the staff did. And we never got paid nothing. There was a ward where uh, there were bed patients and they had to be fed, fed. And there was one girl that was in bed and she was quite difficult to feed. They wrapped her up in a sheet, in a bed sheet. But these two staff, <laughs> they didn't do that. And I'm feeding one person next to her, and there's two of them trying to make her eat. She would not eat for them, and they slapped her till she cried and left big red finger marks. And that girl at that time must have been maybe 13, 14 years old but she had red finger marks on her body, and I kind of thought, I'm going to do something. And, but you had to be very careful what you said and how you put things. Um, they either put us in a corner or either sent us to a, uh, a quiet room with a little window and a door locked. You slept on a mattress, and that was it. That was called punishment. You, you had to be very careful what you said and done. It wasn't, for me, it wasn't an easy life, but I managed. And when the little, ki uh, little kids come in, oh, I just, I thought, mm, I can imagine what those little kids are going to go through. It was... Pantana, did you ever think of having your own family, having children, or...? I can't. That's all I say. I'm not able to for a certain circumstance. For people like myself and others, we didn't really deserve to go there. We shouldn't have been there in the first place. I've seen lots.
Teta wanted to be part of the Freedom Tour, she just offered. She packed the bag. Uh, she brought her toothbrush. Teta wanted to give us a hand with the interviews. Hi. Hi. How are you guys? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Good. I'm Bonnie. Yeah. This is Judy. Show them the way, Jude. There we go. Should we come this way? Should we come this way? Susie, sure. Tada, they were interviewing Judy, but her experiences at Michener Center are, are so bad. She had to go upstairs so she didn't have to uh, listen to everybody talking about it. My name's Bonnie Picard, and I'm Judy's youngest, younger sister. Judy has um, two other sisters. Judy's the oldest in our family. Jude doesn't use words to communicate, so the doctors kept recommending to my mom, pushing my mom to put her into Michener Center. And so my mom um, did not want that to happen, but finally she did give in to the doctors and she put Judy into Michener Center at the age of 11. When, when she was 17, um, they, they gave her a hysterectomy. They, they uh, sterilized her at the age of 17. Um, they ha had said that, well, they didn't even tell us what that she actually had that. We just read that in a report that that had happened, that she had been sterilized. But um, there was lots of reasons that we'd heard about afterwards. So that was a terrible, terrible thing that happened to her. And why do you... Well, I think that the reason that they sterilized her was because there was a lot of sexual abuse happening in this institution by staff. Unfortunately, she's pretty vulnerable to... Uh, that kind of, an, of things happening to her. So I believe that that's something that um, was going on quite common, quite common there. And I think that that's why they were sterilizing people. It was really built up for our family that it was be a nice place. And then when it, in reality, it turned out to be one of the biggest nightmares of her life. To this day, Jude um, really still suffers very much emotionally from the things that happened to her in Michener Center. Um, she doesn't sleep at night. She just cannot sleep at night. She's very afraid of the dark. She can go three to four nights without sleeping. You know, my sister lived with 65 other people in her bedroom in, that, in Michener, and the door was locked from the outside. So there was lots of awful things that happened in those rooms at nighttime when, um, when she was there. She was very, very upset with living in Michener Center, and she used to. She was quite self-abusive, and she used to bite herself. So, when Jude was uh, 24, they pulled all her teeth. Um, she never ever adjusted to living in Michener Center. She hated it there, and uh, she's she she's constantly, I think, tormented by the thoughts of Michener now. Still, even if you mention the word Michener Center to her, she's upset for at least two days afterwards. She just is so, it has taken such an emotional toll on her. Um, I think that, you know, I always say her Down syndrome is not Jude's problem. She has these emotional problems that she deals with on a constant basis and still deals with those every day, the, the, uh, the horror of what happened to her in Michener Center. She's had her nose broken. She's had her knee um, kicked out from, like her knee was dislocated, somebody kicked it. Um, lots of those kind of things have happened to her in Michener Center. She had lots of abuse. They're very unsafe places. I think that people are harmed. There's lots of abuse and neglect that still happens in those facilities. It was, it was just something you wouldn't do to your animals it was just the treatment was unbelievable and they would mill around all day you know it was just mill around all day in those rooms with nothing to do so the treatment is just uh, you can't even imagine how they would treat people with like a prison uh, people had nightmares. They put them in a lockup with no pillows, no blankets, and there's no bed. Like, I was only supposed to be there for two weeks, and that was more than two weeks, and it was just like prison. They were too mean and that. Uh, 
I'm speaking directly to you today in this moment how I feel about institutions. I have a lot of a lot of years of experience. I've been through them. They're nothing but a hellhole. No matter how many ways people tell their stories, it's all the same thing. Nobody should live like that. Marion Kekeroi. I, in 1968, I went in the train school when I was 13. The residential school and my mom, they signed me in there. And I was supposed to be in there for six weeks when I went through that test. They put in your, and I passed it 100%, but they still kept me for three years. But first they went and put me on a job at the hospital ward. There's one staff there, he says sexual abuse me. I couldn't tell nobody because I kept it inside of me because they won't believe me if I did toll eh? because of I'm a native woman, native girl that time, and they wouldn't, they won't believe me whatever I say, they'll use that against me because of, you know, how that situation is. When I was in a residential school, I went through sexual abuse in there and I just didn't want to <laughs> go through that all over again. But I came out of it. <laughs> took a while, but I didn't expect that was going to happen when I went in there. And I'll never go back there. So I know they'll need their jobs and all that, but... I'm John Cox, and I'm from People First Nova Scotia. And I'm really excited to be on the Freedom Tour. I really believe that all institutions across the country should be closed and must be closed. Hi, Neil. How are you? Good morning. How are you, people? Not too bad. After I came on of Bellevue, I swore that I would change the world if I could for people with, with challenging needs. Do you remember why they put you in Bellevue? Yeah, the doctor told my my parents to put me away because I'd be a disgrace to the family because I was retarded. It wasn't Valley View then. It was Saskatchewan Training School. So you knew it was a training school? Yeah, and I thought that it, maybe I was going to get education, educated there. Yeah. Can you explain a little more the education you got? I um, think you... to, to learn, they put, the staff put uh, the point across, and they put it across really well, not to trust anybody. What was it like? Uh, bear with me. Uh, try and imagine in your mind opening the door of a big room with about a hundred men. And that was your bedroom. That was our whole do our whole cottage. There was cottages. Did you notice any abuse while you were at Valley View? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have, did, have you yourself experienced any abuse? Yeah, but it, I don't like talking about it, so I'd rather not. Oh, yeah. That seems like so long ago. Did you ever try to get out? Did you ever try to run away, or...? Oh, yes. <laughs> My cousin, his girlfriend, and me, and a baby carriage and a doll. Yeah. We stole, <laughs> we stole the, the, the van. 
Neil Mercer tried to drive. He didn't know how to drive. And I, I, I never driven a vehicle either in my life, but this was my freedom I'm looking at. So I decided, well, hell, get out of the way, I'll drive. <laughs> we were stupid. They caught up to us. We were already, we are almost into Winnipeg. Then they brought us back and And Jerry and I went to a side room, no bigger than a jail cell. It was a big steel door and a little window, and it locked from the outside, and we couldn't get out unless they let us out. So. Took all my clothes from me and turned off the heat in the side room and hosing me down with cold water. And there's nothing in there but a, a, a sheet sort of thing, and you laid there. And then they gave me, uh, the, I don't know, morphine or something to make me really sick. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Nobody should have to live in there. The first time I ever visited an institution, a large institution, was Michener Center. I went outside and threw up, and I just thought, what kind of humanity are we that we would force people to live under those conditions? Here we are at Bill Hogarth's house. He was at Valley View for a, for a long time. So you have to come into Moose Jaw with us, or? Yes, I am. Yeah? You're going to have to show us where that cemetery is tonight, because I have no clue where it is. I want to do that very much. Right. Come on in. I think all the memories I've got left, they're all bad memories. Bad? How many years did you live in an institution? Or all those years? 42 and a half years. 42? They said, there's only one way you're going to get out, out. And that's if you start behaving yourself a little better. What were the kinds of things that you would do that would upset staff? Run away from that place. I did it too many times. The last time I ran away from Valley View, I jumped the train. But I had a seizure. And I fell off the train, lost both my legs. even ran away from that place in my wheelchair a couple of times. Did you ever regret running away? No. It was pure hell. There's no way, other way to put it. We got hit around and boxed around like you wouldn't believe. And some of us were thrown in side rooms. 
that they still have there. Do you have any good feelings about Bellevue? No. No, I don't either. My anger and my hate towards Bellevue. Uh, I don't know. Will it disappear? I don't think so. Hey, yeah. Bill? Yes, it's going to. It will. It's already happening. The reason we are having this vigil, we are together to grieve our peers who died while living in Valley View. This circle of people is our gift to our friends whose hearts are with us right now. <laughs> Forgive us because we do not like Valley View Center. Give us, a thank you for giving us a choice in life that we can be here and help those that need our help and want our help. Thank you for all the people that gathered around, the, around me and around the rest of us as we say goodbye to our loved ones. As the time was going on, the three weeks of the 52 days, we, it seemed to us that they more and more were planning on keeping my daughter there permanently. They kept extending it and extending it. Um, I was called and told by the CEO, I was called by her and told, you can't take her without permission. You have to have the psychiatrist's permission. This was a year ago that it happened. A year ago in 2006, we never thought these kind of things happened. It was an institution. It was like we used to see in the movies. A way that we thought about it was those things happened way back when, 30 years ago, not nowadays, but it was just so many things. And it all led up to us finally being locked out. We went to see my daughter one day and we were locked out of the building and we were told we can no longer use the front doors. I can't even say how I feel about what is going on out there, about the other people in there, the people that, I, I just can't believe there's places like that still running in Canada. I, I'm floored to have seen what I've seen out there. So, thank you. We shall overcome. David met his friend Freddie in, at MDC, and they've been they've been friends ever since. We shall overcome. Someday. What I'm concerned is that Freddie will die in that institution, and nobody will ever know, oh, not even David. Please. And Freddie will never get the chance to say goodbye to David. And I do believe we shall overcome someday.
black and white together. Black and white together. Black and white together. Oh, deep, deep in my heart. And I, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid today. Oh, deep, deep in my heart, I, I do believe. We shall overcome someday. We shall all be free. We shall all be free. We shall all be free someday. Deep in my heart, and I, I do believe we shall all be free someday. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace someday. Oh, deep, deep in my heart, and I, I do believe we shall live in peace someday. Peter, wave to your fans, everyone standing. <laughs>